Welcome to this video. In this video, we're going to talk about stasis dermatitis. So I'd like to begin this video with a story. And it's a story from when I first became a junior doctor and went through a phase of diagnosing bilateral lower limb cellulitis. So here we go with the story. So I began my career in medicine on acute medicine. And your job in acute medicine is to clerk in the patients who A&E has referred for admission into the hospital. So one day I was sent to um, clerk in this elderly gentleman with dementia. And the significance of him having dementia is that you might not get such a good history. You're not going to get a story that tells you necessarily what's wrong from the patient if they've got um, dementia. However, I had his blood test results, a and &E had done his blood test and I had the results in front of me and I knew what was wrong. I knew that he was septic, he had some severe infection, he had a very elevated neutrophil count and an elevated CRP. He might have even had an elevated lactose, I can't remember, but certainly he had an elevated neutrophil count and an elevated CRP. So I knew he was infected somewhere. Now, there are only a few common sources for infection. The two most common ones by far are chest, uh, either a lower respiratory tract infection or even pneumonia, uh, and then urine, so urosepsis, a severe UTI. Those are the two most common ones, but also on the side, uh, cellulitis is another big cause of sepsis, and then more rare abdominal causes of infection, so diverticulitis, appendicitis, biliary sepsis. I suppose if you had really severe bacterial gastroenteritis, that could potentially cause sepsis. Uh, so, you know, if you've gone abroad and caught something foul, uh, then you could potentially get abdominal sepsis from that. Um, but the two main ones by far are chest and urine. So, I went to go and see this patient to perform an examination to talk to them to try and identify the source of their sepsis. And I performed my examination, had a look at the legs, because you always have a look at the legs in any patient. You want to see, are they swollen? Um, do they potentially have a DVT in one of them? Do, do they have heart failure? You know, you, you always look at people's legs. Do they have cellulitis? Um, and in my naivety, I looked at his legs and he had bilateral redness of the lower parts of the legs, so the shins and the calf regions. Both of them were bright red, and I put on a pair of gloves, had a feel, and it felt really, really hot. Um, so I then decided that this gentleman had bilateral lower limb cellulitis, that that was the source of his infection. Um, I wrote it all down in the clerking performer. I think I even prescribed him antibiotics for cellulitis, so anti-staphylococcal antibiotics. So I prescribed him IV flucloxacillin, I imagine, provided he wasn't penallergic. Um, and I wrote everything up in the clerking performer, put him away and let the nurses prescribe the IV flucloxacillin or administer the IV flucloxacillin and um, moved on to the next patient. And then what happens later on is um, a consultant will come and review your clerking um, and correct it if necessary. So the consultant arrived for post-take review, um, picked up my clerking performer, had a read of it, and then came over to me. And this consultant, I, I quite like this consultant. She's got quite a lot of sass. We'll call her Dr. X. And she knows that I can appreciate the sass, that I appreciate the comedy value of the sass. So she, if you think that she's mean at any point in the story, you have to appreciate that we understand each other and that she understands that I appreciate the comedy value of the sass. Um, so she comes over to me. And um, I look at the patient that she's holding, you know, which clerking performer, I look at the name on the clerking performer, I recognise the name and I say, oh yes, Dr X, this is a nice simple case of, we'll call her Dr X by the way, her name is not really Dr X, um, but obviously I can't give you her real name. Um, so I say to her, Dr X, this is a nice simple case of leg sepsis. And then she turns around to me, looks at me directly in the eye and says, well, according to you. And then we march off to go and see the patient. Um, and she gets to the patient, introduces herself, and then starts to perform the examination, talks to him for a little bit, and then starts to perform the examination, pulls up the covers to have a look at his legs, looks at me, rolls her eyes, throws back down the covers, and, say, and booms, no. Um, 
And um, she then discovers that he's got a long-term catheter that I missed, um, and therefore that the source of his infection was likely a catheter-associated UTI, almost certainly, in fact. Um, so we have to change all the antibiotics from the anticellulitis antibiotics to anti-urosepsis antibiotics. Um, anyway, so... Um, she then takes me back away from the patient and turns to me and says, there is no such thing as bilateral lower limb cellulitis. What he had was stasis dermatitis. And that is the purpose of this story, to teach you this lesson, that there is no such thing as bilateral lower limb cellulitis. No matter how convincing it looks like it, it is almost certainly stasis dermatitis. So there's the story over. Let's now talk about what stasis dermatitis is. So um, we will contrast it to cellulitis. And that's going to be the overarching theme, the overarching lesson of this video, that there is no such thing as bilateral lower limb cellulitis. It will be stasis dermatitis. So let's start with what stasis dermatitis is then. It's got other names. You can also call it stasis eczema. So dermatitis is another name for eczema. It's the, if you like, fancier medical name for eczema. Um, and I should just say this actually. Eczema. When you say eczema, people always think of the type of eczema that children get, which is, strictly speaking, called atopic eczema. So the eczema that they get in the antecubital fosses and potentially in the back of their knees as well, uh, the flexor um, areas of the skin. Um, however, eczema is much broader than that. Eczema literally means inflammation of the skin. Dermatitis is another name for eczema. Dermatitis and eczema, they mean the same thing. And dermatitis is much more descriptive. It means inflammation. Itis means inflammation. Dermatitis, derma refers to the skin. So it's inflammation of the skin. And there are loads of different types of dermatitis, loads of different types of eczema. However, in the common sense of the word, when people talk about eczema, when pe non-medical people talk about eczema, they almost always only think of that single type of eczema, which is the type of eczema that children get, the allergic type, atopic eczema. However, there are loads of other types of eczema, and this is a different type of eczema, so it's different to the type of eczema that children get, but it is still a type of eczema. So be aware of that, that there are much more forms of eczema than just atopic eczema. So just to list a few others, there's seborrheic dermatitis, seborrheic eczema, um, there's contact dermatitis, contact eczema, then there is the atopic eczema, which is the one that people often just think of when they say eczema. And then there's this type of eczema, stasis eczema as well. Uh, there's even a type of eczema which occurs uh, from the skin being far too dry. Zerotic eczema is another type of eczema. So there are loads of different types of eczema. Eczema does not just refer to that type of eczema that children get, which is strictly speaking called atopic dermatitis or atopic eczema. So... Back to stasis eczema then. So stasis dermatitis, stasis eczema, there is another name for it as well. Sometimes it's called venous eczema or venous dermatitis. However, it's better not to call it that because it can, ref it can occur from lots of other reasons other than just chronic venous insufficiency. That is one cause of it, but loads of other things can cause it as well. So stasis dermatitis or stasis eczema is the best name for it, but you will sometimes hear people call it venous eczema or venous dermatitis. So, what is it then? Now, this is the place in the video where it would be lovely if we had a picture. However, I do not want to get done for copyright, so um, I don't have a picture to show you, um, but I'm going to draw a picture. So, stasis dermatitis is a skin disorder that occurs typically on the legs, and it occurs in people whose legs are swollen. Their legs are edematous. And there are loads of different reasons for people's legs to become edematous. And I'll just go over those quickly in a moment. So let's just draw a pair of swollen legs. So swollen legs are very, very common. Um, so there are loads of different reasons for people to develop this. But loads of people do develop it in older age. Because lots of people develop one of the conditions that leads to this. And... Far too much fluid accumulates in the tissue space surrounding the cells in the legs, and the legs become really quite swollen. And if you were to take your finger and press down into uh, this tissue here, 
It might even be so swollen that it leaves like a pit where your finger pressed in. Uh, and if that's the case, the edema is called pitting edema. Uh, and it's really quite severe if that's the case. So you can push your finger in here and it might take a long, long time for that pit that you've made with your finger to actually come back up and return um, to the normal position. Um, so this is a picture here then of pedal edema, and let's just go over some of the causes of pedal edema. So pedal just refers to the feet, so pedal edema. Um, so lots of different causes then for pedal edema. Let's go over the main ones. Um, so heart failure is a cause of pedal edema. In heart failure, the heart is struggling. The heart is weak and is strained continuously to try and maintain cardiac output. Um, so if you think about yourself, uh, this is, heart failure is a complicated topic. And one of the things that really, really helps me to understand heart failure is to think of what happens when you go for a jog. If you're not, you know, if you're not an Olympic athlete and you suddenly start sprinting, if I was, I, I'm a little bit out of shape now. Uh, if I was to suddenly go on a sprint, I would, you know, I would feel really short of breath, really sort of tight-chested um, and exhausted. In people, that's because my heart is suddenly becoming strained to create that sort of level of cardiac output uh, that is required for when I start jogging. My heart becomes really strained, and that's what is creating that sense of breathlessness and chest tightedness. In people with heart failure, which commonly occurs as you get older, and risk factors for it are very long-standing hypertension and ischemic heart disease and valvular heart disease, all of these things lead to heart failure. But in these people, uh, as you get older, if you've got these comorbidities that are damaging your heart, your heart becomes weaker and weaker, and it gets to the point where just maintaining a normal cardiac output, a cardiac output that you need at rest, is as difficult for your heart, for this person with heart failure's heart, as it would be for one of, uh, for someone who is young to go jogging. I'm going to say that again because I don't think I've done a very good job of explaining it. So if a young person, let's say a 20-year-old, goes jogging uh, or goes for a really, really vigorous sprint, they may feel breathless and chest tightness. And that sensation is actually coming from their heart. It is the sensation of cardiac strain. Your heart is really sort of having to work harder than it would like to create that cardiac output that is needed for jogging. Now, in someone who is, let's say, 80 with heart failure from long-standing hypertension, let's say, their heart is now so weak that to maintain a normal cardiac output, the cardiac output that is needed at rest, their heart is continuously strained in the same way that the 20 year old's heart becomes strained um, when they go for a really rigorous sprint. So in these people, they feel sometimes breathless and chest tightedness all the time. Even when they're sitting in a chair, they might feel that sort of same sensation as the 20 year old would feel when they are jogging. That's, that, someone once told me that and I really, really actually like it as an explanation for what heart failure actually feels like for the people who have it. Um, and unfortunately, when the heart is strained in this way, for reasons that aren't completely understood, and there is a beautiful model of this, and I have taught this in several videos that I've made previously about heart failure, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system model of why you become fluid overloaded, why you become congested in heart failure is a beautiful model. However, the more you actually delve into it, the more holes you find in it. So I'm not going to actually go over that model because as I say if you look into it in detail holes start the holes in it become apparent um, so what I will say is that in people with heart failure where their heart is now so weak that it's strained continuously just to maintain the normal cardiac output for reasons that are not completely understood we have some understanding of it but it, the model isn't complete they become fluid overloaded their kidneys start retaining fluid their intravascular volume goes up, the pressure in the intravascular compartment goes up and that spreads fluid into the interstitial compartment and they end up edematous all over the place. They end up systemically fluid overloaded. And one of the place they, places they accumulate fluid is in the legs. So heart failure is one of the key causes of pedo edema. Um, 
And in that case, you'll call it congestive heart failure. So I'll just add in here congestive heart failure, CHF. So heart failure and congestive heart failure are not necessarily the same thing. People can have heart failure where they are experiencing this breathlessness, chest tightedness from cardiac strain all the time at rest, and they might not necessarily be fluid overloaded. Congestive heart failure means that they have heart failure and it has caused this fluid overload status. They've become congested. So in congestive heart failure, they end up with the peripheral edema, the pedal edema, so bilaterally swollen legs. So that's one of the key causes. Um, another big cause is chronic venous insufficiency, CVI for short. Um, so this means that the veins in the legs are no longer working correctly and they are not taking the blood back from the uh, legs up into the body. So the, often it means that the valves in the veins have broken and blood cannot be moved in the correct direction anymore because the valves are absolutely essential for moving the blood against gravity. Without the valves, the blood is, not, is going to move backwards and it's just going to um, pull in the legs. So chronic venous insufficiency is another big cause of pedal edema. Uh, lymphatic insufficiency, whoops, Lymphatic insufficiency is another cause, um, and this causes what we call lymphedema. And in fact, I'd like to say just a few more words about this. So people often use the term lymphedema incorrectly. People often use this term interchangeably with edema, but it's not interchangeable with edema. Edema means the fluid overload in the tissue space. Uh, lymphedema means edema due to lymphatic insufficiency. It does not. It is not just another name for edema. So if the lymphatic vessels are not working, the lymphatic system is not working, then lymph isn't going to be moving out of the legs uh, up into the body. And again, that can lead to fluid overload in the legs. That can lead to pedoedema. And um, one of the common causes for that would be if you have cancer in the lymph nodes. So let's say that someone has um, ovarian cancer. Let's say they have um, right ovarian cancer and it is spread to the pelvic lymph nodes and that can now block lymph from moving through those lymph nodes and those lymph nodes are probably uh, draining the lymph from the legs. So the lymph from the legs is now not going to move, specifically from the right leg it's not going to move because it's the right pelvic lymph nodes that are um, diseased, um, and therefore you might end up with right leg lymphedema. So that would be another cause for fluid overload of a lower limb. We'll have a break here and we'll continue in the next video.